Well, rumors of this being a humorous talk have been severely exaggerated. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised I'll make some enemies with it. I hope not. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Well, uh, as, uh, as advertised tonight, I, I'd like to take a little while talking about the future of astrology as a profession. Now, uh, we look at the uh, offerings at a, a conference like this one, like uh, Norwalk, and uh, we see an awful lot of essentially rather theoretical material, which is absolutely wonderful and, and, and fine. It's how we, you know, we, we keep growing, we keep the, the edge advancing by, by discovering in, in powerful but kind of nuanced elements in this language that the, that the heavens have offered us. So uh, theory, absolutely fine. But we see far fewer classes in the, the how-to dimensions of actual astrological counseling. Like the, the realities of, of applying this theory uh, in the, the real life situation that so many of us face as, as professional astrologers, which is here we have a, an intelligent, open-minded human being who knows nothing at all about astrology, and is sitting before us, faced with, a, with a, a human situation, a human dilemma. And I, I, I think deeply about this, just how, how terrifying it must be for a client to come in and, and just sit with a person who can read their beads, just totally read their beads. And, and the, the, where is, the, where is our, our study of, of the actual presentation of this kind of material? in a way that allows the client to, to feel safe and, and heard. Like, uh, you know, the client sits down and, uh, and we take a look at the chart and say, uh, you know, your mother never wanted you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's even worse if we're right. <laughs> and because of the power of astrology, we might very well be right. But, you know, what happens to the relationship in that? I wonder why there is so much emphasis on, on essentially a kind of abstract intellectual understanding of astrology without the, the corresponding focus on how to make it palatable and digestible to human beings who might actually come and, and help us make our, make our livings. I have a, a, another, uh, another observation along a fairly similar lines where uh, imagine, uh, you know, given the realities of of, of the astrological counseling situation, which is, you know, really the definition of profession in practical terms for most of us, you know, making our livings working with people one at a time. There are other options, but there are like trace minerals in the, in the astral economy. So we, we find that, that we have learned, uh, learned this incredibly exciting stuff about the, the uh, tertiary converse progressions of the asteroid Hygieia, <laughs> to the midpoints of the Uranian planets. You know? <laughs> and you know, maybe it's really cool, and it came across very powerfully and effectively in a lecture that we heard, and, and we find that we have, we have maybe two hours with a client, and, and we have, we've spent 47 minutes you know, on, on that tertiary progression, <laughs> and you know, we still haven't mentioned that transiting Pluto is opposing your moon. You know? <laughs> And then finally, we, we, we have uh, two and a half minutes left to talk about Saturn, you know, going to conjunct their sun in six months. And this is not to make fun of the study of the tertiary converse progressions of the asteroid Hygieia, which might actually be quite effective and interesting and helpful, but it is a lousy sense of strategy in terms of what is important. So I, I've often said, and sometimes to the chagrin of some of those who hear me, that, that uh, the, the simplest and most basic kind of astrology is where 90% of the bang for the buck goes in terms of actually making a difference in, a, in a, another human being's life. And there, the, the theoretical understanding is the easy part. The, the understanding about the skills for presenting this material in a way that is comprehensible and palatable to an individual who knows nothing about astrology and isn't particularly interested in learning how to be an astrologer. Why don't we focus more on that? How often do you see classes in that subject offered at conferences? You know, 
and again, this is in no way a criticism of what is offered in conferences, but I think it is the beginning of a statement about uh, uh, a great um, unexplored continent of possibility in terms of, of, of establishing a foundation for the future of astrology as a profession. Because the bottom line is how to reach people with it, how to make a difference in people's lives. And we, we can do that, but we just don't seem to talk about it very much. So we see in the prospectus for an astrological conference uh, a triumph of the theoretical over the practical very often. And uh, maybe a nice, uh, a nice draw between the theoretical and the practical, a good Libra balance between them would be um, a, a better goal. But I, I, I want to get even more, more concrete here. Um, and, and just to be totally clear, um, I, I'm using the word professional here tonight. You know, speaking of professional astrology, I'm going to characterize someone in this talk as a professional astrologer. I do not mean somebody who is really good at astrology. Hopefully that is implied. But what I mean is somebody who's making their living as an astrologer. You know, professional can be a, a kind of generic adjective for skill, and that's fine. But that's not what I mean here. I'm talking about the actual reality of earning your living as an astrologer. Now, as I was mentioning, we almost never see anything about the, uh, the realities of the presentation of this material to people. But here's something we basically just flat out never see. And that is, you know, classes and support in general about how to establish your business as an astrologer, how to attract clients, how to, how to make a living at it. Isn't it interesting that this subject that is so compelling in, in our daily lives, I mean, we're all worried about paying the bills at the end of the month and so on, it's such a compelling subject, but we, we seem to have elected as a culture or as a tribal group to avoid it in our community. Um, uh, one really happy exception I'd like to mention right away, uh, uh, Robert Blaschke, and I, I wish you were here now because I'd like to embarrass him a little bit you know, by, by praising him. He's written, a, uh, he's working on a multi-volume uh, series, Astrology, A Language of Life, and his volume three in that series uh, is a, a handbook for the self-employed uh, astrologer. And it's you know, really just soup to nuts, you know, how to establish your practice, really practical, concrete stuff. And, and uh, you know, I liked it so much, I wrote the introduction for it. And this was a few years ago. I think he's done pretty well with it. But I, again, I, I, I've not seen him invited to, to present that topic at a conference. I, you know, that may have happened and I missed it, but I, I certainly haven't seen it. So, the business of astrology. Now, I'm not talking about boasting about income, boasting about how much money we make. I don't want to plug into that particular aspect of the American dream. And I also don't want to plug in to the, the opposite side of the same coin, which is complaining about how, how little money astrologers have, how, how tough it is to make a living as an astrologer. So it's not boasting or whining you know, about money, both of which are just simply tacky enterprises as far as I'm concerned. I'm talking more about the, the concrete second house reality, to use the technical astrological term, that underlies the viability and the social respectability of any profession, that gives it public credibility and sustains its attractiveness to new generations of professionals. Now, uh, the uh, Increasingly not so young astrologer Moses Siragar III, you know, some of you know about him, uh, he uh, interviewed Robert Blaschke at, at length, verbally, uh, 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 about the subject of establishing uh, astro an astrological practice. And then he did a, a joint telephone interview um, with uh, Bob Mulligan, who's a really fine professional astrologer, uh, the, uh, the ravishing and intelligent uh, Chris McRae. Uh, and, uh, and myself, just a, a nice uh, four-way phone conversation with Moses kind of modulating it, simply a, about the, the business of, of making an astrological practice fly. Uh, I, I recommend this interview for anybody who's interested in, in making the transition, you know, from uh, away from just simply studying astrology for the joy of it and the personal growth of it and into 
actually making a living with it, is we, we focused on an awful lot of the real nuts and bolts realities of, of how to actually do it. This interview is, is available on uh, Moses Sirigar's website, which is uh, uh, www. Uh, astrology for the soul, all one word, astrologyforthesoul.com forward slash success. Uh, that's where he has it listed on his website. It's a, it's a CD, and I, I think you can probably download it if you're interested. Now, I've been making a, a good living solely as an astrologer for about 30 years. I never had any family money, grew up in a three room apartment, walk up in New York, you know, just didn't come from a professional background, didn't come from, from any kind of money. And then, you know, doing something that is, is actually not all that common in the world, which is actually just paying the bills in a fairly comfortable way, week by week, month by month, as a professional astrologer. Now, when Moses Sirigar approached me to, to be interviewed about how I pulled that off, it was the first time anybody in the astrological community had ever asked me that question. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I've been asked privately, you know, people who are trying to make the transition, you know, wanting some insight and some support, but, but never publicly. And, you know, I'm not offended by that, or it's, it's not, not like that at all, but isn't it interesting that in our culture, that seemingly fascinating and certainly compelling subject just doesn't come up? And why? Seems like it should be an interesting subject. Because uh, you know, it's your survival. Doesn't come up. Taboo. And underlying everything I'm saying is this utterly Capricornish point that if astrology is going to have a future as a profession, it is pivotal that we get the message out there to the public that it is a profession. Simply that. And that means lots of people, you know, the masses in the world, simply knowing that a whole bunch of intelligent people are paying professional astrologers for their sophisticated and personalized services. It's not looking up on the internet what's going to befall all the Sagittarians in the world today, you know, but sophisticated and personalized astrological services that are worth money to intelligent people. You know, if, if it were understood that that, that reality existed, our world would be transformed very quickly. But the, the general public really doesn't have much of an idea that that is happening. Lots of astrologers actually able to make comfortable middle class livings. Until that is widely understood, astrology will not be perceived as a profession. We simply won't have credibility. I, I, I feel uh, sort of uh, like I'm gonna spread a dorsal fin up here in front of you talking so much about money. Because you know, I participate in the cultural embarrassment around this subject. I've had some anxiety about doing this talk. I gave a talk like this one every time. Usually my talks are pretty popular. Only time I've had a talk that was basically pretty unpopular was essentially on the subject. I, I'm not gonna mention the venue because I don't want to embarrass the venue where it happened. I, I, I do need to insert some very basic truths in that Emotionally and spiritually, you know, in my heart, I feel grateful and privileged to be an astrologer. The, the older I get, the more grateful, the more privileged I feel about that. You know, I, I remember uh, you know, being a, like a younger astrologer in my 30s, and you know, I, I was making it, but I you know, wasn't, wasn't getting rich. You know, just kind of paying my bills and doing okay. And, you know, sometimes I, I have some some anxiety thinking, you know, gosh, you know, I could spread a dorsal fin too and, and you know, become a corporate water or something. <laughs> no, with a haircut, I clean up. <laughs> never seen me with a haircut. Top of get some sense of it. <laughs> I came to a crossroads in, in, in my life, and this is in my late 20s, and oh, it was, what a charged moment this was for me. I, I, I'm middle 20s, I guess, actually. I had a, had a data set. I've been working for the National Institute of Mental Health, and 
and uh, you know, it's just just a job to to stay alive and doing astrology in the night and so on and weekends and and I had a data set that uh, I, I basically uh, you know done an end run around the fact that there's no funding from the government for studying astrology, no scientific evidence for astrology. It's not, not exactly true, but but you know one of the reasons that uh, solid scientific evidence for astrology is a little hard to find is you try to get funding to study it scientifically. You know they, they create a, a kind of double bind for us. And and well I was able to do an end run around that. I had this National Institute of Mental Health data set and uh, and basically, it, it, it statistically indicated that there was something even to sun sign astrology. That's all I was able to study because I, I, I didn't have access to people's birth times and all of that. So I was thinking, gosh, I you know I can write a book about this and, and be rich and famous and you know on Oprah. I guess Oprah wasn't there in those days, but you know the moral equivalent of Oprah. And uh, with that data set, on one hand, I had an opportunity in life. This is just critical crossroads for me in my, in my 20s. The other opportunity was to go be a speechwriter in Washington you know, for a, a senator. Why? It's kind of a long and complicated story, but you know. And you know, there was you know, a life of uh, power, glory, riches, and you know, sucking up on the trough of the public welfare. You know. Speechwriter in Washington. It was for a Democrat, too, you know. <laughs> So I wouldn't go to hell, just purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, I'd be driving uh, you know, like a there, you know. So I, I chose to write a book, you know, about the, the uh, my statistical study, and uh, you know, the book never got published. I'm kind of actually glad it never got published because I don't want to get known as a statistical astrologer. That's not really what I am anyway. But it was that fork in the road, and and it, I guess the reason I'm, I'm Putting this little bit of autobiography in it is that you know there I was torn between uh, a kind of conventional path in the world and and the life of an astrologer and it was a hard choice for me at that time you know I made what I think is the right choice but I made it by a cat's whisker you know because the temptations of the more mainstream life were were pretty strong and now I just think oh thank God you know here I'm 58 years old and I never never question the meaningfulness of my life. I mean, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. you know, because, yeah. you know, I value that more and more. I suspect if I make it to 70, I'll value it twice as much as I do now. That, that's how precious astrology is to my heart. And I, I, I could go on and on about that, and it would be a real feel-good kind of talk for us all. But here I am talking about the future of astrology as a profession, and in realistic terms, it is impossible to discuss the word profession while systematically avoiding the subject of money and making one's living. It's not an honest way to talk about profession. So I, I do want to come back to that somewhat uh, less comfortable topic. Unabashedly, second house focus in this talk. I do want to emphasize that I have no intention whatsoever of being insulting to astrologers who work at a purely theoretical level and have no interest in these professional questions. That's absolutely fine. Astrology is an inner journey, and an astrologer might serve the rest of the astrological community with theoretical work or translation or you know any of the other ways that, that we might uh, conceive of a way to not make any money at all while working really hard. <laughs> so, thank you. I mean, I'm laughing, but thank you for all those who contributed at that level. And, and I also uh, really ditto for everyone, probably many here, who are drawn to astrology purely for reasons of personal, spiritual, psychological growth. And no intention of making any money at it at all. God bless you too. God bless us all. There are lots of good reasons to be drawn to astrology. And I want to emphasize that in focusing on the idea of, of astrology as a profession here, I'm not attempting to exclude anyone. I'm just focusing on a question that seems to be systematically avoided and essential to the future health of our profession. So we have unconsciously adopted a cultural bias against discussing this subject in a nutshell. And I think we're thereby shooting ourselves in the foot and making it difficult for the generations who will come after us. And we've got to stop that. 
I think we are behaving generally like a bunch of 19th century English gentlemen, you know, in their drawing room drinking sherry, um, pride themselves on never dirtying their hands with the practical questions that concern tradesmen and uh, would never dream of broaching a taboo subject of each other's finances. Mm. 19th century English people, you know, in the drawing room. Let's do a little math. According to a 2003 Paris poll, fairly recent Paris poll, of 2,201 adults, about 31% of Americans believe in astrology. Now, God knows what that means, you know? But, uh, you know, do you believe in astrology? Yes, you know, or maybe, I guess, and, you know, you know people uh, answer. But, you know, those polls that predict how elections go, et cetera, they're often reasonably close. And, we, you know, we have essentially the same science here. So, you know, 31% of, of Americans, and forgive me focusing on America, that's the only country for which I have these numbers, um, there are now about 300 million Americans, not, not counting the 275 million Guatemalans. Uh. <laughs> and some, some of those are my friends. <laughs> so 300 million Americans, 31% of 300 million people is 93 million people. So you've got 93 million people, and it's silly to take these numbers too seriously, but impressionistically, 93 million people in the United States of America who profess to believe in astrology. That's a lot of people. 93 million. Wow. Now, according to Stephanie Clement, of, uh, she was speaking for the American Federation of Astrologers, uh, Americans spend about $200 million a year on astrology. $200 million a year. This is a quote from, again, Stephanie Clement quoted uh, by a, a Bloomberg uh, news service. It was in a sidebar uh, to a story in the Seattle Times uh, for August 26, 2006. That's where I got, got that information. I don't know where Stephanie Clement got these figures, you know, the, the uh, 31 period, well, the, the, the uh, $200 million. But it certainly sounds like a ton of money, doesn't it? $200 million. But what it really means you think about it, it gets a little depressing. Those 93 million people who are our potential customers as astrologers are annually spending an average of $2.15 each. And you, can get a, you can't get a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks for $2.15. Would you call this a successful market outreach on our part? dollars and 15 cents. What are we doing wrong? Uh, Amazon uh, carries uh, more than 48,000 titles that touch on astrology. You know, touch on it. It's about 48,000 titles are available on Amazon. You get astrology on Yahoo's front page, you know, AOL, etc. It's everywhere. The 93 million figure is really plausible to me as far as the you know, the people who are interested in it. Let's go a little further with the numbers. Uh, there are more than 10,000 full-time astrologers in the United States and up to 175,000 part-timers. And again, this is all according to that, that article from uh, Stephanie Clement that was quoted in the Seattle Times. So 10,000 full-time astrologers, 175,000 part-time astrologers. The, all of these numbers, you know, starting with the two hundred million dollars and down to the numbers of professional astrologers, I, I I do think we really have to understand that they're quite impressionistic. Just to get a little reality check on this, I I, I shot an email to my friend Kelly Fox, who, who was behind astrology.com, you know, some years ago, doing different things now, just to ask her are these numbers real, because I know she's try, constantly trying to like pitch venture capitalists to get get money to to start, you know, internet kinds of businesses. So, you know, she has to be able to entice them, you know, with, with uh, you know, hard numbers about how much money they might be able to make. So uh, this is what, what Kelly wrote back to me. Um, there are no market size numbers for astrology in the U.S. or internationally, which is a problem we have been having you know, in terms of reaching out to the venture capitalists. We have been pitching on the potential. It's like putting a wet finger to the wind Really, sorry, I can't be of more help. You know, and this is a woman who's actually, you know, made a quite a large fortune with astrology. 
the numbers are not there. But I'm, I, and again, I thought the worst happened to Clement got, got her numbers. I'm just going to continue to play with them. 200,000 people or so uh, who earn some or part of their living from astrology. A couple hundred thousand people who you know might accept some money for, for doing astrological work. Now, again, if Americans spend $200 million a year on astrology, then each of those 200,000 astrologers would bring home an average annual astrological income of $2,000 per year. The average high school kid working a summer job at McDonald's will do at least that well. And of course, the, the $200 million wouldn't all go to professional counseling astrologers. You know, that, that's like the, you know, allegedly kind of a gross figure for, you know, for, for the income. So it doesn't count the money people spend on astrological books. That, that was, I think, $38 last year or something like that, or maybe it was down to 36. It's, it's hard to sell astrological books like that. But it would also uh, you know, include money you know, given to websites, and astrological t-shirts, and coffee mugs, presumably, and probably Philip Sedgwick's uh, famous line of Zodiac sex toys, too. Right. <laughs> 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 a whole collection. <laughs> Boys and the girls' versions. <laughs> <laughs> Philip is going to run a, run a workshop at midnight tonight. <laughs> Now, actually, you know, I don't think that the situation, the you know, business situation for astrology could possibly be as bad as, as these numbers suggest. I, I really don't think it's fairly this bad. I suspect that $200 million figure is actually way, way, way low. I mean, one, one piece of the puzzle, uh, there, there are, uh, you know, this, this will vary from state to state and county to county, but, uh, you know, I, I, when I file my income tax, I'll call myself a consultant. You know, why should I incriminate myself in the county in which I live, you know, by confessing to the feds that I'm breaking a, a county ordinance by practicing fortune telling? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to play, the, well, not happy, but, you know, smart enough to, to not, you know, announce loudly and publicly that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking, uh, I'm guilty of a misdemeanor. And I, I, I doubt I'm the only astrologer in this kind of situation. So right away, the incredible difficulty of figuring out how many people are, out there are actually making their livings as astrologers. Many of us will call ourselves something else. But I, I don't want to belabor you with uh, too much autobiography. But um, the fee for my own astrological readings probably slightly at the high end of the market because I'm pretty well known about it. But my fee is $275. And I, I do, uh, uh, if I record a reading, it's a couple of hours. It's kind of a little longer than average, probably. If I'm sitting with a human being, I'm probably going to go more like maybe two and a half hours for that, that $275. So the fee is probably per hour, not that far off from mainstream astrological numbers. But you know, I'm, a, I'm a Capricorn with Saturn and Virgo on the mid so I bang my head against the wall on a daily basis. And, you know, basically, uh, it's a slightly more complicated than this, but I essentially do uh, two of those astrological readings each day for five days out of the week. I'll do about 10 of those readings in a week. And that's my income from astrological counseling. Uh, Jody and I uh, sell our books and, and our recordings of our lectures as well. We have our seven plus press and, and I teach some and, and have my apprentices. And when I'm teaching or writing, obviously I'm not doing reading, so there's some, some kind of trade-off between them. But the point is, you can do the math and take a, take a pretty pretty accurate plus or minus 10% guess about my, my annual income. Now, of course, I've just broken a huge taboo by even saying that. You know, even socially, we're, we're kind of discouraged from, from mentioning things like that. That's a delicate subject. Well, you know, Jody and I own a home, we're building a second one, got some money saved up for old age, and I look, look in the ephemeris, and I see I better start spending that money. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> got that second Saturn return coming up. <laughs> That's probably what I'm talking about all this stuff. I try to be an elder and, you know, make it safe for the next generation to come up and, you know, learn some of what I've learned. 
I mentioned that joint conversation that uh, Moses Sirigar re recorded with, uh, with Chris McGray and Bob Mulligan and myself. Now, I, on, on that CD, um, Bob Mulligan went public with, with his annual income. Chris elected not to. And uh, uh, out of, out of the, the sheer gentlemanly delicacy, which I am decrying in this talk, I'm still not going to mention the income figure that Bob Mulligan uh, admitted publicly uh, uh, in this recording, but if you're curious, you know, buy the CD. Uh, but uh, Bob Mulligan uh, makes considerably more money than I do. He's not really a famous astrologer. He's kind of known in the astrological world for his, his work with the Old Bible Organization for Professional uh, Astrologers. He's a wonderful man. Uh, to me, Bob Mulligan is a very archetype of a professional counseling astrologer. Uh, he is incredibly skilled and competent at what he does. His community, communities actually travels around a bit, value him. He's never going to play the famous astrologer card. You know, my hat is just off to all the folks like Bob, who are out there in the trenches, you know, helping their clients day by day, never uh, experiencing the uh, incomparable glory of standing here at the podium at Norwalk, you know, hobnobbing with stars like Madonna and Lauren Albandia and Philip Sedgwick, you know. <laughs> Great. But, you know, I, I have no idea how many people are out there like Bob, you know. That 10,000 figure, 10,000 full-time astrologers, as they say, it, it's, it's conjectural, it's probably way off, but, but I know that that, that, that some of them right here in this room now, you know, people making a living doing this. I know from my travels around the country, it's kind of a nice side effect of my work. I, I get to get pretty intimately connected with a lot of different communities. I have this strange feeling, I put it into words one time, I, I don't feel like I live in North Carolina, I feel like I live in North America, you know, just because I'm, I'm, you know, have intimate, ongoing relationships with with, with people and you know through the astrological community, kind of a nice feeling. I, and I know from my travels around the country that basically in every town or city where I, I get to know the astrologers, there's always a, at least one or two astrologers who who seem to stand out in their communities, who are are honored above the rest, who are making making their livings at it full time, who who have all the clients that they can possibly handle. You know, these are the people who have really internalized not only the theory, but also the practical reality of how to build the bridge to those intelligent folks out there who don't want to learn astrology, but just want to be helped by it. And, you know, these are the people who so often are, are on some in our community. Many of them I have discovered, that this is impressionistic on my part, but many of these people don't really seem very excited about coming to conferences. You know, many of you have never been to one or went to one and decided that it was a waste of time. Now, I, I don't share that attitude, but I, I do report it. And you know, these are folks who, in my opinion, should be teaching at conferences because they know something that the rest of our community really needs to know. This piece of the astrological community that's represented by the, the, the part of the tribe that goes to conferences is not a representative or random sample of the people who do astrology out there in the world. Our, our biases away from the practical and away from the counseling context have made our community and our mythology less appealing to those people. If we can put out the welcome mat, I suspect they, they, they will be here, but they need to be honored as those who can teach us. You know, rather than, than are presuming that they have come here to learn about the, our latest theory about the tertiary uh, progressions of the uh, asteroid Hygieia or something like that. They're going to teach us what it means to have transiting Saturn cross your sun. You know, and those of us who have our noses in the air thinking, well, we already know about that. Well, we might be quite surprised at what we could learn from these people who, in the trenches, have been able to hold people's hands and help them get through that, and maybe they've learned from their clients. I know 98% of the astrology that I've learned, I've learned from my clients, you know, just from the real world of listening to people, watching them. These, 
these people are living proof that astrology is a viable profession. Every day they are painting masterpieces, doing astrology at its highest possible level and touching people's lives. And all their best work, all their greatest victories are buried forever behind the inviolable bond of client confidentiality. I just, I like to say that out loud. The incredible masterpieces, the highest state of the art expression that astrology can conceivably reach, the elegant two hour presentation intervention in the life of another human being, where all the theory is integrated and brought to a focus that makes a difference in the, in the experience of another human soul. And it's secret, it's secret. These masterpieces that we'll never know about at least not specifically, but we sure can know about them generally. We sure can honor these people, and we sure can invite them to come and teach us. So again, sing their praises. Now, ethically, of course, no counselor can ever out his or her private clients. You know, we, we just cannot do that. This is an especially sensitive issue for astrologers, given the present social reality of astrology, uh, a client's reputation could so easily be damaged if it got out that he or she had consulted an astrologer. I remember when the big flap over the, uh, the ESAR uh, ethics code was happening. It was, a, it was a very interesting process. I talked about that a couple of years ago. Ethics are really very, very complicated subject, something I didn't know until I got involved with it. There was a, a, a movement afoot, this is coming more from the psychological vector, that, that you know, if an astrologer was was, was counseling uh, a person who was in psychotherapy, with like a, a licensed therapist. There was a suggestion that the astrologer should should contact the therapist to make sure that there wasn't some you know playing off of the two counselors or some kind of tension you know between them that the therapist should be informed and and uh, that made a, a certain sense. I, I argued vigorously against it because it involves outing your client to the client's counselor. You know, the client, you know, might be embarrassed to tell the psychotherapist that he or she was seeing an astrologer. And I felt like we didn't have any right to out our clients. I put confidentiality at the top in, in terms of, you know, my, my hierarchy, my poker hand of what was important ethically. And thank God that that perspective seemed to win the day and get enshrined in the, in the, in the code. So, we really honor honor the idea of confidentiality, but this uh, the shaming of astrology. It, it's another unfortunate side effect of the fact that astrology is simply not perceived as a serious profession, and a lot of this swings back to some of those kind of second house issues I was talking about. Among my clients, whom I wish I could name, because uh, not to blow my own horn, but because it would be so good for the astrological world. I've got heads of international banks, you know, people who are, you know, in charge of billions of dollars, who are, you know, been ongoing clients of mine, A-list movie stars and television stars. And, you know, some of them are, well, actually the ones that I work with are real intelligent. I'm sure some of them, you know, out there are brainless, but still, you know, would have some some impact, you know, for people to know that these famous people attention to serious astrology. You've got major figures in integrative medicine. I've gotten very involved with integrative medicine. Uh, uh, directors of at least uh, three different foundations that, you know, like family-oriented foundations that uh, between them actually control billions of dollars that can be able to intervene in decisions that involve that kind of power out there in, in the world. You know, you know, political figures, you know, locally where I live, but on up to, to Washington, you know, the, had you know, one, one fairly woman politician came, it was funny, you could almost see that there were no reporters you know, before she knocked on my door. Obviously, I can't name her, you know, rock stars, you know. I, I mean, long lists, and the, 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 the point is that if we could get this out, you know, if, if, if the world were such that all those people I, I just, you know, described, couldn't name, if they felt safe in saying, yeah, of course, I, you know, I, I consult an astrologer on, a, on an annual basis, uh, you know, for basically the same reason that you listen to the weather report sometimes, you know, if, if they felt comfortable about saying that, 
what a snowball would start to roll in terms of public acceptance. But other than, uh, other than that brave and exemplary man, uh, become a good pal, Sting, none of these people are eager to be out as my clients. And, and in fact, I, I, on almost every occasion, I haven't even asked them because it's just been understood right, that this was very, very private. I completely understand why. It practically puts tears in my eyes. Now, you know, all this, you know, it's not about my ego. You know, I am 58 with a Sun Jupiter conjunction. My ego has fattened enough in this life. You know, <laughs> you know, baseball has been very good to me. And so, you know, and I'm trying to be a good voice. So, you know, I, my ego doesn't need to get any fatter. I, I'm talking about how to jumpstart a reaction in the public mind, one that makes it safe for not only famous people, but just smart middle of the road people to admit that they take astrology seriously. They're scared to talk about it. And I think that's at least partly our fault. Now, you know, I'm just one astrologer, and I, you know, I know that there are many, many other professionals in our field who work with the movers and shakers of the world. You know, I multiply myself by a by a large number, and you know, who knows how many pies we have our finger in there. But it just never never comes out, never gets talked about. If every if all those well-known people came out at once, you know, at, you know, one time, wouldn't that be great? Well, you know, pigs could fly. You know, it's, it's, it's really very much the same kind of situation. It's not going to happen until we take ourselves seriously as professionals and convey that confidence to the world. Now, this has not been a technical talk about astrological techniques. The only technical reference I have made at all, even slightly, is to the second house. And let's dive into that for a moment. As everyone learns in Astrology 101, the second house is uh, one of its common associations is the house of money. And uh, experience teaches us that this is a valid interpretation of the second house because some transits into your second house or progresses into your second house and, and your financial picture probably undergoes some matter of fluctuation that is consistent with the nature of the planet that has entered the second house or is aspect being the ruler of the second house or you know, however you want to look at it. Uh, experience has, has taught us that the second house is sensitive to, to, to finances. Now, from the point of view of evolutionary astrology or psychological astrology, the second house would be about money, but, but it also includes the more psychological notion of your self-worth, your sense of your, your dignity, your confidence in yourself. These two ideas, money and self-esteem, are very closely related. We just observe the, the brittle kind of shame that poverty engenders in a person, how, how uh, apologetic and, and demeaned we feel if, if we're poor. And we occasionally observe tremendous ego inflations that go along with great increases in wealth. I'm thinking of uh, the Devil's Dictionary from 100 years ago, Ambrose Bierce, and, and he, he included uh, the, the, the rich man's definition of wealth, the word wealth. And, the definition was, this is a sign from God indicating, this is my beloved son, at whom I am well pleased. <laughs> they laughed 100 years ago, then along came the new age, and for a while nobody laughed. Now we're laughing again. <laughs> so, our self-worth and our net worth, idealistically, we might like to decouple those. We might, with good basis, recognize that that there should not be shame in poverty. But when we understand the human reality of what struggling with poverty means or struggling with wealth means, either of those, the way they interact with the issue of self-esteem in an inflationary or deflationary kind of way. Now, so these two notions, self-esteem or dignity and the finances, deeply linked. Now, back burning with that for a moment. Uranus has passed through Aquarius. You know, that, that's over and done. I guess uh, the, even the Vedic folks are beginning to agree with that statement. We're getting close. And four or five years, uh, Neptune's going to leave Aquarius too. Now remember when 
when we were anticipating the uh, Uranus and Neptune entering the Aquarius, you know, some years ago. There's a, a lot of us, my, myself included, um, we were predicting that this might bring much wider public acceptance to astrology. It seemed like it would be good for astrology because we always tended to associate the sign Aquarius with astrology, and I, I think there's some validity in that association. But this, uh, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to know. Uh, has, has there been uh, an increase in astrology's public acceptance over, you know, the, this, this recent period? Uh, if so, I don't think it has been dramatic. Uh, I'm inclined to think, if anything, we might have lost some ground. I, I don't feel good saying that, but uh, I, I certainly haven't seen the great increase that, in support for astrology or interest in astrology that, that many of us anticipated. And meanwhile, disturbingly to me, confusingly to me, the astrological world itself under these Aquarian energies has fragmented into a, a tower of Babel. Uh, it's a chaos of mutually incomprehensible systems. I don't know what to think about this. You know, we have modern Western astrology, still probably the mainstream language. You know that that you know most of us will, will have some familiarity with just mainstream Western astrology. What we has, used to call modern astrology, although the word seems to be losing traction a bit. Um, we, of course, have Vedic astrology, which is you know, becoming popular and powerful and, and claiming more and more ad adherence. And we have uh, you know, evolutionary astrology, the territory that, that you know, I tend to identify with myself. And it's got its own unique set of principles that you know, are, are quite different from modern Western astrology, quite different from Vedic astrology. It's not just a different philosophy. There are different techniques within it. Uranian astrology, cosmobiology, the, uh, the various uh, Hellenistic traditions, the, the, uh, the various Renaissance traditions, which, uh, as I gather, I'm no expert in those territories, but they seem to be fairly mutually incomprehensible, too. We barely speak each other's languages anymore. This is what's happened to the astrological community under this dual impact of Uranus passing through Aquarius and Neptune you know, passing through Aquarius still currently. We've experienced this fragmentation. Now, this, I, I introduced this part of the talk by saying I am disturbed by it, but also confused by it. I, I think the idea that there is one true astrology is, is a completely crazy and destructive idea that we can blow out of the water in, in you know, seriously inside of an hour. I mean, anybody who thinks Vedic astrology does not work, anybody who thinks that, that that zodiac, you know, ain't Christian or something like that, you know, get a reading with uh, Dennis Harness, he'll blow you away. Vedic astrology works. I've not had any personal contact with a, a Hellenistic or, or, or Renaissance reading of my own chart, but I've heard good things are, are, are coming out of those schools. Uh, all honor to them. It's a different system. Though. Evolutionary astrology is the most exciting thing that's ever come along, as far as I'm concerned. But I don't want to say that so you should feel the same way I do. You know, maybe you're just as excited about Vedic, or maybe you're just as excited about Uranian astrology. But gosh, you know, when I was a young astrologer, we come to a conference and, and we could have really good arguments because we all spoke the same language. And, and then we would argue within that. But I can't even begin to argue with a Hellenistic astrologer. I don't know what they're talking about. And and when 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 I talk about the you know the the the, uh, the planetary ruler of the south node of the moon and in a uh, fourth harmonic aspect to the south node the south node of the moon indicating a skip step in a prior life, you know, I I, I can say that to a, a modern evolutionary astrologer to get it, but somebody who's not in initiated into the system doesn't know what I'm talking about. And and then, you know, in this, you know, barely speaking each other's languages, all, all too often what we hear are insults and misunderstandings hurled over these ever higher walls that separate us. I I speak of the predicted renaissance of astrology 
does Uranus pass through Aquarius, Neptune through Aquarius? I observed that it did not happen. I think it could have. I think we were asleep at the switch. I think one of our mistakes was fragmenting so much that, that, that we, we wound up with a war with each other rather than reaching out to the world. And I think we have completely dropped the ball as far as supporting astrology as a practical trade. I don't want to make that word dirty. As a profession, as something we can do in this world, help people and make a living doing it. Now, you know that old uh, chestnut about the academic world, you know, about why uh, you know academics tend to be so nasty to each other, they backstab each other so much and behave the way they do, and the answer is because the stakes are so low. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a dirty, dirty jam at, at, at the academics of the world, but it, it, it does get a chuckle, you know, because the stakes are so low. That's ghetto behavior. Most of us know that ghetto behavior is driven by those two intertwined second house specters, poverty and low self-esteem, the great drivers of the, of the typical ghetto mess. So what can reunite the astrological community without sacrificing our diversity of voices? Because that diversity is not gonna go away, I don't think. Well, in the heart of every astrologer, with whom I would enjoy sitting down and having dinner, is a feeling of wonder and gratitude that the heavens say something about the human soul. If we don't have that in common, we're not astrologers. And we have a compelling desire to share that, that squealing, healing feeling with as many people as are willing to listen to it. We're excited about it because of what it's done for us, and we want to reach out and touch some other people with it whatever astrological language we may be using in order to accomplish that end. This is professionalism, where we are united by the impact of the craft upon the end user, rather than our ability to play one-upsmanship with each other, or out technical each other. This professionalism is the spirit that can unite us. This, this faith in our work and in ourselves that triggers in us a reaction of generosity towards the human community, and that generosity cannot exist towards others in the larger community unless we take two steps first. Find a generosity towards ourselves and express a generosity towards the other astrologers in our community, no matter what house system they use or what century they favor. Generosity. Let's claim this dignity. Let's not flinch from one important piece of this process, where we must allow the second house logic, core second house logic, to teach us that we cannot have this precious dignity so long as we make financial questions a taboo, because money and self-esteem are intimately and irrevocably bound together in the logic of the second house are taboo about looking at this underlying second house foundation of astrology as a profession is undercutting our capacity to be generous towards ourselves and towards each other. We've got a domino theory kind of thing. We've got a, a descending spiral that can turn into an ascending healing cycle. And that's what I'm talking about. The second house is a unified field. You can't have part of it without having the whole thing. We don't need to be rich. That's not there's, there's enough richness in what we do, but if, if I had to design a curse for my worst enemy in this world, I've got a few possibilities, and some of them not too repeatable in a nice society like this, but, but, but one of my favorites that I would say publicly is, uh, may you have a job that pays you only money. <laughs> but thank God, if you're making your living as an astrologer, you're rich. And how I changed our approach. I remember the first time I did it, I charged somebody five dollars, you know, and uh, you know I had like a cold sweat. <laughs> I wasn't going to be worth it, you know. <laughs> but you know, the first time you charge somebody a little money for a reading, you take yourself more seriously. You're thinking of yourself as a professional. You know, you've got to work a little harder. You've really got to do your best. 
we also recognize that age-old observation about how the, the client will typically take the information more seriously if they have paid for it. And so you get that synergy of the person appreciating it more and you doing better work, all because a $5 bill went from one person's wallet to the other person's wallet. Or nowadays, maybe it's a little more than $5. There's the second house. The, the exchange of the, of the money with the issues of dignity and well-being and generosity, all bound up into the transaction. It's trying to get over being 19th century English gentle people. Uh, please don't think I'm saying it all comes down to money. It, it, it does not. I'm just saying that resolving the plague of self-doubt that limits us and marginalizes us and increasingly which fragments us as a community cannot be separated from facing the fact that astrology must begin to take itself seriously as a profession, and that we cannot do that without getting over our fears and our taboos around money. So how many of you here tonight, you know, make all or a significant part of your living from astrology? Can you see some hands? Hallelujah. I just want to say thank you, you know, for all of the victories that you've had that nobody will ever know about, all of the differences you've made, all of the souls you have touched. Thank you so much for dedicating your life to this scary and wonderful path that we call astrology. I hope that by the time I'm really old, there's 10 of you for everyone that we saw tonight. So thank you. Alrighty, for those of you who are in the mood, the dance is getting ready to take place. Sure.